firstly, thanks for the opportunity to, um, to be part of this and really just to, I suppose, give a different perspective on some of the, the, the issues that have been discussed here this morning. If I can tell you a little bit about Cree, first of all, what we do, and that sets the, the context for, from uh, where this perspective is coming from. In case you haven't heard of us, we're a Heart and Stroke Foundation. We've been around for 33 years in Galway. Uh, the initial um, history of the organisation was about building cardiology infrastructure in the uh, west of Ireland, um, pushing the health service to uh, bring forward developments that would at least bring Galway and the west uh, on the same stage as the rest of the country. So to a large extent, the early years were about fundraising and forcing uh, the government to match that funding to develop cardiology. But in the latter uh, 10 to 15 years, our focus and shift, uh, our shift in focus has gone very much to pre-hospital and post-hospital, um, keeping people out of hospital and looking at prevention and recovery. And uh, we now um, reside in a, a purpose-built facility not far from here, which um, I, I believe currently is the only centre of its kind, not only in Ireland, but indeed um, p possibly in Europe, which is a centre dedicated to uh, prevention and uh, recovery from cardiovascular disease. And we, what we have there is a multidisciplinary health team working across the cardiovascular spectrum with input from uh, clinicians and specialists in the areas of heart, stroke, diabetes and obesity. And in essence, there are probably four main um, areas of activity there. One is working in the space of lifestyle and behavior change, because some of the um, figures that, you, that were quoted here this morning around stroke and, and heart disease um, are, are quite staggering when you look at the impact they have on, on, um, on human life and on our economy. But it, what is even more staggering is that 80% of cardiovascular disease can actually be prevented. And the prevention of cardiovascular disease can largely um, be um, influenced by changes in our, our, our lifestyle and, and, and our behavior. But it's a very difficult thing to do. And uh, that's part of what we're doing in the Cree Heart and Stroke Center. It's looking at models of intervention around behavior and lifestyle change and testing those models to see do they have long-term um, and sustainable impact. The second area of our work is around education. And um, I suppose our education work could be described in, in two ways. One would be a population approach to education, so raising awareness of various cardiovascular conditions to the general population. And then more specifically, I guess, the, a high-risk targeted approach looking at individuals who we know, and you can quantify cardiovascular risk numerically, literally, and by doing that, you can predict the likelihood of a cardiac event in someone's lifetime in a 10 to 15 year uh, lifespan. Then if you know that and you can identify these people, what are the interventions that you can um, use to try and reduce the, the, the likelihood of a cardiac event? And that's some of the work that's happening in the education space. And then in the research area, we're, we're very much collaborators in research as opposed to leaders in, in research. But in the collaborative area, the sort of stuff we're looking at there is um, looking again at the, at the lifestyle space, looking at um, um, issues like hypertension, um, heart failure, uh, conditions that um, are having huge impact in, in our population, but again, that have um, origins in behavior and lifestyle um, issues. And, and the, fo the fourth area would be in the area of, of patient and family support. So this is where we get down to the, the sort of brass tacks of what the impact of cardiovascular disease is. So uh, the, the reality of um, having a diagnosis of a cardiovascular condition or having had a cardiovascular procedure and what impact does that have uh, on the individual and their family. And there are a number of different uh, supports that we put in place in that regard. And I suppose in terms of the perspective to what you've heard already um, uh, this morning, what I would suggest that you might also consider would be, would be two things. First would be the, the whole question of prevention. I think it's absolutely fantastic to see 
um, the evolution of so many devices and, um, and, and, and therapies for all the, the cardiovascular diseases. But if you stop and take a look uh, at the, the, the fact that 80% of these conditions are largely preventable, what, um, what, are, what are the barriers to um, investment in, as it were, working further upstream and looking at technologies and devices that perhaps uh, could assist in preventing these conditions which are now resulting in these very expensive uh, procedures and, and devices. So if I, if I, for example, if I, can, if I give a couple of examples of what, I, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here, if you take something like stroke, you've heard already about um, how the cost of stroke in the human terms, um, the cost of a stroke in terms of its economic impact, and we know that stroke, some of it, the majority of it, uh, in terms of the, the, the risk factors, again, are lifestyle modifiable risk factors, so we know we can do something about it. And if you take uh, perhaps the most devastating stroke, there is very strong evidence to suggest that the cause of most, the most devastating stroke is atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm. So by detecting atrial fibrillation, you can ultimately prevent uh, a devastating stroke. So why are we not uh, focusing on technologies and devices that will detect atrial fibrillation? Uh, because we know that atrial fibrillation increases over the age of 60. So there's, there's a lot that's known about this condition, and yet we're not um, focusing uh, energy on looking at technology, devices, or therapies that can um, perhaps prevent the, the ultimate stroke. And there are many examples of this in the cardiovascular space. Hypertension, again, n not just... Uh, a contributing factor to um, to stroke, but also general um, uh, um, cardiovascular disease. Um, and we know, for example, that despite all the best guidelines, and there are guidelines to boot in terms of management of hypertension, the reality is that hypertension is not being managed and that the proportion of the population that are currently walking around with undiagnosed hypertension is actually frightening. Uh, and yet you can detect hypertension by just taking blood pressure. Um, you, you wonder, again, it, it's such a simple thing. Uh, are there ways in which we can be more innovative in detecting hypertension? There was reference to um, aortic stenosis. And there have been fantastic developments in TAVI and, 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 and development of, of, of new valves and so forth. And then you say, OK, so there's an element of uh, aortic stenosis, which is a, a factor of lifestyle, but perhaps the predominant uh, contributory factor is age. So therefore, you know that over the age of 60, 65, there's a greater likelihood of aortic stenosis. Uh, and something as simple as a stethoscope examination in your primary care could actually identify the murmur that might be indicative of this stenosis. Yet, um, for some reason or other, the practice of examining patients in primary care using a stethoscope is virtually non-existent. Um, the practice of taking pulses which can detect atrial fibrillation, again, virtually non non-existent in primary care, why? Because of time pressures and other variables. But again, are there technologies, are there new ways of either incentivizing or developing methods of, of um, interaction here? I think uh, it's something that needs to be um, carefully and urgently considered. And the second um, point I'd want to make in terms of offering another perspective this morning would be the perspective of the patient. So it is fantastic to see again the devices in drug therapy and or the developments in drug therapy and medical devices. Um, but it's only in recent years that actually the people in the in the research domain are beginning to realize actually we're producing devices and we're producing medicines where the end user is a patient, but actually the patient isn't part of the conversation at all. Um, and so now you have innovative programs like PPI which are encouraging 
the engagement um, between researchers, clinicians, and patients in this conversation. Um, and, you know, you look at our health system. In fact, you can't call it a health system. It's a sick system. And it's a sick system because the focus of the system is on looking after the sick. We have no investment, relatively speaking, in trying to prevent people from getting sick. But in this sick system, um, at, at, at whatever level you, you, you look at, whether it's at the primary care or secondary care, the patient-clinician contact time is now uh, diminishing at, at an inordinate pace because of the pressures on the clinicians. They estimate that the, the, the average uh, primary care physician-patient interaction is 10 minutes. Now, if you're an elderly person, to get in and get out, you can lose three minutes and another two or three minutes for the, the small talk and introduction. So actually, the contact time is now down to somewhere between four and six minutes. So we have a situation where our health system is crumbling under the weight of chronic disease. Chronic disease uh, is primarily diagnosed in, in, the, in, for example, in the initial stages in primary care. So you have situations where patients are going in to their doctors, they're in an interaction of four to six minutes getting a diagnosis of a chronic condition, being prescribed medication, or being referred for some uh, therapeutic intervention, and they really have no understanding of either their condition, what caused it, what the treatment is for, and, how, and, and what, what it's going to do for them. And the consequence of that uh, in my experience is that you have an unempowered, uninformed patient who is therefore not motivated to be compliant with their therape therapeutic regime and therefore not only are they costing the state in terms of waste uh, use of, of resources but they're also not maximizing their own health uh, benefits. So you have a myriad of issues there that um, are easily, I would say, um, solvable, but there doesn't seem to be any concerted or planned uh, effort to do that. So those would be two sort of thoughts I would just add to the mix uh, this morning in the context of bringing science to, to um, the screens in the, in, the, in the area of cardiovascular disease to perhaps look at, are there things that you could um, expose here in the context of what we need to do from a preventive um, uh, medicine point of view and also um, moving towards a more empowered, more engaged and more educated patient in the context of getting the maximum return on investment. That's purely in terms of the, the, the medical and, and a health cost of investment but also to maximize quality of life and longevity. So just some thoughts. help um, just comparing it to Spain where I'm from where the patient receives their own test results for everything from blood urine tests to everything and then they have to bring them to the GP or to the different specialists I, I see people I mean sometimes they misinterpret it but they're more informed straight away because they get to read I'm high in this I'm low in this and what do, do you think that might help also in Ireland if the, the patient had that direct uh, yeah. yeah well I mean we have demonstrated through some of the work that we've done that where the patient is more informed, mm -hmm. they are more proactive, they're more compliant. Very simple study we've done recently in the area of hypertension. We went out into the community, we screened people, we discovered the, the, the rate of hypertension that was um, um, presented here this morning. We divided the group into, into two, one normal care and the other got a, a brief educational intervention from a cardiologist, a nurse specialist, a dietitian, and a physiotherapist. Total intervention, um, three hours. And uh, we, we compared a baseline measurement to six months later from both groups, and the difference was actually um, quite staggering. So much so that the improvement, actual improvement in blood pressure in that brief intervention, if it was a drug, uh, it would be just phenomenal. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a very small, uh, it's a very small study, but one would argue that if you could extrapolate that 
uh, to a, a wider population, the key message would be educate, uh, inform, ownership and so forth. But I mean, the challenges here are we, we don't have, for example, um, uh, even a, an, an electronic um, record uh, keeping system here. So in terms of you know, a patient coming into a hospital today, they get results or they get um, information. Uh, chances of, 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 you know, when the, on their second visit of, of meeting a doctor who actually has, has a full understanding of this patient's history is unfortunately not as, as, as it should be, you know. Okay, thank you.